Welcome to Network's Tech Talk. I'm your host, Kaylee Pickens, and we have another great conversation for you today. We hear a lot about 5G these days, but what are the goals for 5G and how far has it come? And are there still any technology advancements or effective spectrum and governmental policies needed to move us down the road? With me today is Robert Kubik, Senior Director of Public Policy at Samsung Electronics America, and he is here to help us understand what it will take to effectively implement 5G in our networks. Thanks for joining us, Rob. Thanks, Kaylee. Let's begin with discussing what 5G will do for us that's different from our current 4G networks. Rob, can you share more about the difference between the two? We have a bold vision for tomorrow, a world of connected devices working seamlessly to make life safer, more manageable, and a whole lot more fun. As you know, every cellular network generation has had a purpose. The first generation allowed basic voice calls, second generation improved coverage and capacity, and the third generation allowed us to browse the web. And most importantly, the fourth generation allowed a breadth of mobile applications. If I must summarize the purpose of 5G in one word, it would be experience. 5G has three main goals. First is extremely fast mobile connectivity, 10 to 20 times faster than 4G that you currently experience. You'll be able to download an entire movie in under 10 seconds. The second goal is ultra low latency. Latency refers to the amount of time it takes for your phone to send a signal and get a response. With 5G applications such as remote surgery will be possible and think about the improvements to the gaming experience with the ability to have instant feedback. The third goal for 5G is enabling the Internet of Things, which allows billions of devices to connect to the Internet. Internet of Things, or IoT, is a catch-all term for equipment that isn't a traditional computing device, but is connected to the Internet to send data and receive data. This includes just about every electronic device in your house and office, wearable health monitors like your smartwatch, wireless inventory trackers, and shipping containers. The IoT will accelerate the amount of data available to us and achieve huge economies of scale. That sounds awesome. But with 5G still fairly new, what technology advancements are still needed to make it more mature or increase its adoption? Well, 5G may be new from a services perspective, but it has been under development for over 10 years many of the technology advancements already have been made. For example, antenna improvements such as beam forming and massive MIMO. MIMO, or M-I-M-O, means multiple input, multiple output, and refers to the number of antennas used to communicate with our cellular devices. Massive in this context means anything over eight transmit and eight receive antennas, but 64 send and 64 receive antennas are out there allowing for a huge increase in transmission capabilities. Other advances including radio technology, but with better scheduling of transmission and advanced modulation and coding schemes. Another one is aggregation, allowing networks to send data using combinations of various networks such as Wi-Fi, legacy 4G systems, and the new 5G network all to the same device. Finally, the use of new frequency bands. Service providers use a blend of low, mid, and high bands. The lower bands carry less data, but carry the signal very far. The high bands carry a huge amount of data, but the signal doesn't go a relatively long distance. And the mid bands are kind of in a sweet spot here and carry a good amount of data to a reasonable distance. The technology will continue to evolve and get better, but we certainly need more spectrum and effective government policies to drive its adoption. Thanks for that, Rob. Can you tell us a little bit more about the frequency bands that are used for 5G? And also, what kind of governmental plans are needed to move us down the road? That's a great question, Kaylee. The frequency bands I just mentioned, low, medium, and high. The FCC did a great job of bringing more of these to the marketplace. In the low bands, carriers are deploying in all bands available. 600 megahertz that was reclaimed from broadcast TV transition to digital. Advanced wireless services that was formerly fixed in government use, as well as the bands where 2G, 3G, and 4G services were being deployed are transitioning to 5G. In fact, Samsung helped us along by producing equipment that uses Dynamic Shared Spectrum, or DSS. This technology allows a carrier to deploy a base station and initially operate using 4G, then with no changes, transition to using both 4G and 5G with that base station, and then finally, transitioning to all 5G services. It's a great way of using technology to provide a smooth transition to 5G. Over the last few years, you've seen a significant uptick in the mid-band spectrum. 
First was the introduction of CBRS, or Citizens Broadband Radio Service. It is in the 3.5 gigahertz band as an example of a technology for shared spectrum among various spectrum users. This band has been used by the DOD and they still have first crack at it. The good news is that they're not using it all the time or at all the locations. Now here's the good part, when they're not using it and they're not in most of the country, then paid licenses can use it. And if the paid licenses are not using it in a particular area, it's free to everyone there. This is the first example of this type of technology sharing to be used in the world. Just last February, the FCC completed selling access rights in the C-band or the 3.7 to 3.98 gigahertz band. This spectrum brought in a net bidding of over $81 billion to give you some indication of the demand. We expect more of these valuable mid-band spectrum to open soon. The FCC is auctioning 3.45 to 3.55 gigahertz this October. And the FCC and other parts of the U.S. government is studying opening 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz. Finally, high bands, or what we call the millimeter wave bands, which are frequencies above 24 gigahertz. Being so high in the spectrum, these bands can carry an amazing amount of data, but then they are limited in how far they carry. Service providers will use a blend of these low, mid, and high bands to maximize their coverage and capacity. It sounds like a lot has been done on the spectrum front, but is there anything else that can be done to help speed us on the 5G road? Besides these new bands, there are several other things which can be done to bring 5G to all of us sooner. First, we need to reduce the time it takes to get permission to put up a cell site. Second, we need to reduce the cost of broadband deployment. In many areas of the U.S., there is a significant lack of broadband due to the high cost of deployment. Good news is that there are government programs such as the $65 billion to deploy broadband in the infrastructure plan, as well as the Rural Digital Opportunity and 5G funds to help meet this need. Third, we need to reduce the cost of service. The U.S. has some of the highest broadband prices in the world. We can do better. And we have some great initial starts here, such as the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program that came out of the CVAA and provides $50 to $75 per month to keep households connected. As of August 27th, over 5 million households are currently enrolled. The infrastructure plan that's being developed by Congress is working to extend this beyond the current pandemic. Now, we've covered what's been done on the industry front, but can you tell me a little bit more about how Samsung is involved in 5G? Samsung is uniquely positioned to be a leader in 5G. We focus on end-to-end -end technology. Samsung makes all parts integral to 5G. Chips, network equipment, and devices, including smartphones, tablets, laptops, Chromebooks, smart TVs, appliance and automotive solutions, all with industry-leading security standards. This includes the first miniaturized RF chipset and modem integral to 5G. No other company can provide this entire 5G ecosystem with a trusted global supply chain. We have a legacy of innovation. We're building on more than 35 years of experience in designing and engineering communication solutions, leveraging our experience in the implementation of 2G, 3G, and 4G technologies. We're taking the lead in 5G as well. Another unique aspect is our reach, scale, and partnerships. We understand the importance of collaboration and work with partners across the industry to offer products and solutions that bring 5G networks online. Looking at a long history of innovation, there are a few milestones and accomplishments I'd like to point out. In 2012, we demonstrated millimeter wave 5G with one gigabits per second in a fixed wireless environment. Recently, we upped that to 7.5 gigabits per second in that same environment. In April of 2019, Samsung had one of the first 5G phones in the millimeter wave bands at 28 gigahertz and 39 gigahertz. The next month, we added 5G support for the 2.5 gigahertz band. Our latest 5G devices, the Galaxy Z Fold 3 and Z Flip 3, support multiple bands, 600 megahertz, 700 megahertz, PCS, CBRS, Wi-Fi 6, millimeter wave, and even the new C bands and 3.45 gigahertz bands, which are not yet even fully operational in the networks today. Samsung provides the entire secure 5G ecosystem with chips, network equipment, and devices. Thanks, Rob. This is all very exciting. 
I actually read just yesterday from a consulting firm that 5G is estimated to have a global economic impact of $13.2 trillion and create millions of jobs. Thanks again for sharing with our listeners your fascinating insights into 5G. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. And to our audience, thank you for joining us for today's podcast, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Again, I'm Keely Pickens, and this is Networks Tech Talk, a Samsung podcast. Thank you.